as, as a way, as a principle of organization of humans. Uh, what, we, what we should see is how uh, Muslims in Europe uh, consider the spin of Sharia law and what benefits they hope to get from it. And it would, that would be a very good question. I have my, an opinion, but I wouldn't express it. I leave the question open. The, the other thing is we were told that the Nazis had shown themselves uh, as victims. And of course, the storyline is that world Jewry is making war against us. And we have to deal with, punish the Jews before they can accomplish their program, which was according to the Elders of Zion. Now, uh, we haven't re recently read the Palestinian Covenant, but they say in the Palestinian Covenant that there's no justice for the Jewish cause. The, Jew the Jews don't have any, or Israelis don't have any legal claims at all, and the justice that they uh, Sikh is totally absolutist and this copy said is genocidal. Now here is an interesting case where we're talking about an ideology without a system of justice, but it's very, very similar to the storyline that you described of the, of the, of the Nazi era. Yeah. Let me answer the, or, or respond in uh, a couple of different points. Sure. And, uh, this is a law professor, and maybe my responses are not that responsive, but I get to lecture out. Um, one of the, in terms of resistance from the judiciary, there are rare cases of resistance. And Mueller in his book um, has a, a case study or story of a particular judge, Judge Kreisig, who was um, K-R-E-Y-S-S-I-N-G, I always think that there should be a law school in Germany named after him. And he was a probate judge. Um, he was the one whose job was to take care of people who were wards of the state and so he learned about the T4 euthanasia program. And, you know, Hitler signed the order for that. And he, and he as the ward, you know, for these um, people in mental institutions, he issued orders saying to stop the program. And so he was taken, summoned before the, um, the, the justice minister and said, you can't do this, this came from Hitler. And so he continued to go ahead and sign these orders. And what Mueller points out is that, um, the, oh, he, nothing bad happened to him. He was forced physically, you know, physical being. He was allowed to retire and live on. And so Mueller points that as an example, that uh, at least in the early years of the Nazi regime, um, resistance was not futile. And if there was a, enough of a um, dy dynamic of people resisting, it could have made a difference. You know, the, during the height of the, the war, the, um, what's the name of the street? The Rosenstrasse, mm -hmm. you know, right? Where the, 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 the women, um, the wives of... Protest. Um, Gentile wives. The Gentile yeah. wives yeah. Of, yeah. The, um, of the Jewish husbands yeah. were put in, you know, in, in the, uh, I guess, sort of the Jewish center about to be deported. They staged demonstrations. Right? Asking for their husbands, you know, back. And even they were successful. Okay. Um, in terms of Sharia uh, and, and, uh, and, and its compatibility or incompatibility with human rights and civil liberties, I'm not an expert on this. Um, but I will tell you, I am at this point writing another book, which is a textbook on comparative law, which is an introductory book textbook to different legal systems. I'm writing the one in the English legal system, but a colleague of mine is writing one in Islamic law. He's a professor originally from the Sudan, who was imprisoned there and became a person of conscience, now teaches at every university. And his writings are all about the fact that um, you can have a democratic society and within the Sharia legal system. So um, seeing that, it gives me hope that um, that mm -hmm. just because a country follows Sharia law to some extent, that it cannot have um, Western democratic uh, values. Yes, please introduce yourself. Uh, Herb Rosenblum. Uh, do you, in your study, um, consider the fact that when Hitler came to power, he already had the benefit of the right to enact laws by decree? as emergency laws, which started in the Weimar Republic. So in fact, 
Uh, we can't really equate the, uh, the federal system of Germany with the federal system of the United States because the Congress retained its full power, Supreme Court retained its full power, but in Weimar Germany, they had abdicated much of that, and Hitler became a ruler by fiat. The Nuremberg Laws went uh, straight from the uh, national office. So how did that <laughs> impact on the uh, rights of lawyers to view themselves as <coughs> judges of the old system where the Weimar Republic abdicated <coughs> That's not my understanding. I mean, looking at um, the, the relationship of the law upon Hitler coming to power on January 1933, the protections were there. That, they, that you had a liberal democratic system under uh, the Weimar Republic. The enabling legislation giving Hitler the power by decree and the um, Parliament itself, giving him that, came after Hitler came to power. Mm -hmm. One of the, uh, the motivations for that was the Reichstag fire. You know, if you remember, that was used as an excuse um, that there are, you know, somebody else said it and we have to go ahead and do that. So there, was, there were manufactured acts by the uh, Nazis after they came to power. My understanding of the legal legislation, the legislation that existed during the Weimar Republic, mm -hmm. including the Constitution and various protections, um, it was no different than the United States during that time. We have to look at the laws. I, I looked at them closely. That's what I said. I'm Dr. Shalom Friedman, then Justice Reiner, then Sarah. Excuse me, I'm going to go a little far afield and ask you a question about something I really know nothing about. So maybe you'll be able to to get to my question. It relates to international law and the declaration by the President of Iran that Israel is a country that should be wiped from the map. There's an international court of justice. Uh, my sense is that there is not any real reaction. What is the possible reaction? What is the picture? Yeah. Sure. Um, I've actually been thinking about this and I, I plan to give a talk. Um, Dr. Isler, Israel Charney is here, who is the president of the International Association of Genocide Scholars. We're having a, bi a biannual conference in Sarajevo in July, and it's one of the talk that I plan to deliver, because to me it's, it's incomprehensible that a president, the head of state of a country, could make such a statement and for that country to still be a member of the United Nations. Um, I'm, I'm very, very, I was very glad when I, I first heard about in the news the work that the JCPA was doing. Now, the legal mechanism, what to do, becomes a bit more complicated. When you, people talk about the International Court of Justice, um, that is a court which is the judicial arm of the United Nations. Only other nations can bring suits before the ICJ. You know, before there was the security war opinion um, by the Israeli Supreme Court, the ICJ, the World Court, also issued its opinion. And this came as a result of an advisory opinion by which a group of nations asked the ICJ to issue that. That's a possibility. You could have a group of brave nations, I don't think it has to be so brave, to ask for an advisory opinion whether that statement disqualifies Iran from being a member of the United Nations. Because if you look at the preamble of the UN Charter and the statement that he made, completely incompatible. The country cannot be a member of this organization in which came out of the ashes of the Holocaust and talks about the violation you know, of encroaching upon the sovereignty of destroying another nation. Now, as to individual, you know, you bring an individual suit, as president of head of state, cannot. You don't have that possibility. When he leaves office, is there some possibility? I think there are very smart lawyers, smarter than me, that are working with the JCPA to see what are the legal angles that could be done. But with the general nature of his statement, I agree with you 100%. And I think I'm very sorry that not enough Holocaust, genocide, and international legal scholars 
have gone and picked up that issue and said, this can't be. Thank you very much. I'm one of the people who walks in this justice. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd, I'd very much like you to take a look at the work we've been doing and give us your suggestions. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, amazed, as, as you are, that more people across the world haven't simply thrown up their hands and said, this is, this is uh, beyond belief that in 2006 this is what's going on. But it is going on, and it, it could be, and I'm interested in your thoughts, it, it could be that uh, either people have, have uh, discounted uh, what Aminijat has repeatedly said over the past year, uh, saying this is uh, Middle Eastern rhetoric, you might compare it with Nasser's famous uh, let them drink from the, from the Sea of Gaza or Arafat's statements about how uh, they can drink, drink from the Dead Sea. This sort of go to hell type uh, rhetoric which is so common in this part of the world. Mm -hmm. Or might it be that people are focusing on the nuclear ambitions of Iran and, and uh, since that is is, uh, is is more immediate and, and has more of an international um, collision uh, attending to it. Perhaps the people are focusing on that instead. I'm, I'm interested in your in your thoughts on this, and, and of course, uh, any help you can give us on untangling the uh, the maze of, of possibilities, both international and national, mm -hmm. as far as uh, taking action against the uh, Minijad will also be. Sure. I'm more than happy to help. Um, I'll make a, a quick statement. I'm very wary of making uh, Nazi analogies. In fact, chapter one of my book talks about the use and misuse of Holocaust terminology <coughs> in history. But I have to make one. <laughs> that is, as going back to the, to the Hitler years, it starts with rhetoric. I think when you ignore the rhetoric, Jamie had behavior coming in. Now, I'm not the first one to make that point. When Dr. Gerstenfeld made the presentation to my students in July, um, that was, to me, one of the most memorable statements. And I hope the students understood that. Sarah? Yes. Uh, I want to make a point about the by the European Union for the protection of individuals with regard to the processing of personal data. Could you say one more time? Okay. Just one more the protection of individuals with regard to the processing so. of personal data. And this is a European Union directive. directive. So they, they have a, each and every state have yep. their own uh, version of this. Correct. Now, why do I ask about this? Uh, in Finland, they are just now they have a commission investigating what happened in Finland during the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. And they have uh, data collected. And they have data on people who have been turned over to, to Nazi Germany. This is all 60, 65 years ago. Right. Now they want to publish it and they turn to the, their own commission asking for permission and they got a negative answer. Right. Because of this directive you are not allowed to to publish anything. Now this is sort of ridiculous because yeah. we're talking of, of if we're talking about Jews given over to the Nazis, we, we can be quite sure that they're not alive alive and they can't come set yeah. up from the graves and you know yeah. where can you balance this? Isn't it an unbalanced it's 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 law, they're using law for 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 non legal purpose. I don't know how to Sure. I understand. My problem. I understand. Um, the particular example you're giving for Finland, the Finnish are not the first ones to do that. And no, my sure. other area of writing, Holocaust restitution, litigation, the process, that's been used by every single European country and also private um, entities. So when claims were made against the Swiss banks, um, when Edgar Bronfman first came and started talking to Swiss banks, and they wanted to give him a sum of money, he said, I don't want money, I want information. Publish the name of the accounts. The excuse of the Swiss banks, no, no, it's you know, secret information, we can't do that. Um, the European insurance companies done the same thing. Um, and so, if not I, someone else in the United States, an insurance commissioner from the state of Washington says, when you suppress the names, you suppress the claims. See the point? Uh, 
Um, so that's been done by other countries. The French have also done this. You know, they have a law that's even more strict. You can never um, you know, issue any kind of information based upon someone's religion. So they use that as a basis. Well, we can't publish Jewish. Who are the Jewish account holders? You know, there are numerous decisions mm -hmm. issued by, this is the law that I know, issued by American judges all the way to the Supreme Court that you have to take every single law as it's written and put a reasonable interpretation to it. What's the purpose of the law? What was the reason why the legislature passed that? And so if you just look at the text, like you learned this as a first semester law student, I learned, um, you're, and you're being what you would call a strict, strict constructionist. Um, then, as Justice Holmes says, the law is an ass, and I'm using his, you know, his term. I agree with uh, Dr. Falk? Yes, I also want to thank you for a very interesting lecture. Uh, not being at all knowledgeable in legal matters, I, I learned a lot from you, but I want to ask you about one key point that you made about the conundrum, as you put it, about how can the legal system be criminal? That lawyers or law professors are being legal scholars in this country. Now, as far as I understand it from the point of view of a non legal person, uh, laws are made by politicians. They're made by parliaments and so on, elected or non elected officials. And so a corrupt or criminal political system would produce a corrupt or criminal legal system. Mm -hmm. So, in that sense, it doesn't really seem like a connection. It seems like a rather straightforward matter. Uh, secondly, uh, one point here was made about the International Court of Justice and uh, Ahmadinejad. As far as I know, neither Israel nor the U.S. recognize the International Court of Justice. They're not members. Uh, so that uh, even if Iran does, which I don't know if Iran does recognize that court or not, uh, this would seem to be a totally impractical uh, idea because the countries involved here, Israel and the U.S., do not recognize this, the authority of the court. And finally, I have a kind of um, question which does not relate directly to your theme, but it interests me because of my own uh, research. I have come across a complaint made in 1946 by a survivor of the Holocaust who was in the US against Carl Gustav Jung, who was a psychoanalyst, a psychiatrist who collaborated with the Nazis for, for many years. In 1946, he sent a whole dossier that he had accumulated on Jung uh, to what he called the International Justice Commission in Nuremberg. And uh, this was never acted upon, and you can find the documents in the British archive today. It was given to the British Commission, and they just didn't take any action. Can you explain why this happened? Sure. Let me take the last one first. Okay. Well, I'll use another analogy. Jung information came out about Kurt Waldheim. Was he prosecuted? No. So the, the unfortunate situation, if we end up looking at the whole sort of the, the thousands, thousands of people who collaborated with the Nazis, whether Germans or Austrians or uh, collaborators in other countries, as a reality, most of them, almost all of them, I should say, escaped any kind of justice. And the, the, the prosecutions that took place in the IMT, that took place in the zonal trials, uh, American, British, French zone, the Soviet zone, the subsequent prosecutions have picked up very, very few people. And that's just the reality. Um, Carl Jung happens to be one of them. There's a fascinating story, I don't know if you heard this in the news, and I, I want to find more information. You know, the United States um, doesn't prosecute collaborators or Nazis. We just take away their citizenship. Because when you come into the U.S., you have to, and you apply for um, status as a refugee, later on as, an, you know, as a resident. And I saw this somewhere. It even still exists today. They ask you whether you ever a member of the Nazi party or collaborated with the Nazi regime. I know someone who's from El Salvador, and she got the same application. And she had to go ahead and sign up. And so, rather than prosecuting those individuals, which is much more difficult, criminal prosecution with all the constitutional guarantees of criminal due process, we have a quasi-criminal, or quasi-civil kind of in-between proceeding where 
to take away their signature. You might have heard the story of the woman, the last one, number 103, who was just deported back to Germany. And she was a guard in um, Ravensburg. She was married to a Jewish man. Remember that? Remember? Right? And in fact, you know, they bought the cemetery plot where they were buried together. They were living in San Francisco. And uh, how did they, they find her? <laughs> this is the power of the computer. The Office of, uh, Office of Special Investigations you know, saw her name, uh, somehow put her name into Google, and found the obituary for the husband. And her maiden name was mentioned. And when they, they, they located her that way, Eli Rosenbaum, then he personally went to San Francisco, knocked on her door, and said, hello, the Department of Justice is calling. She actually became, she's not, the newspaper said second, first, because she was the second woman who was deported. She was also the first one who was voluntarily deported. Rather than going through the proceedings, she just said and left and you know, told her neighbors and family members that were alive, I'm just going back to Germany. So we're still catching people. Uh, let's see, that's number three. Number two, um, you asked about the um, jurisdiction of the International um, Court of Justice. Israel is not a member. Um, it, it doesn't matter if you're a member or not. Um, there is still a way in which a nation that's not a member, its behavior can be judged by the court, and that's through the advisory proceedings, which did exist jurisdiction. So this, the way that Israel was taken to court in the security wall opinion was through an advisory opinion process, where a number of nations asked for an advisory opinion of the ICJ. They could do the same thing. Let's see, let's get a